it doesn't feel like any kind of sacrifice to be here. It just feels normal. It feels like something that's just great because I'm part of the family, have been for a long time. And when one part of the family needs a little bit of help, you just show up. That's what we do. Um, it's great to have Sue, my wife, with me today. She's gonna, we're going to both share this morning. Um, but we really feel, I'm not going to tell a lot of funny stories, unfortunately, this morning. We really feel we have a word that is an important word for part of your process and healing as a church body. So I'm not going to take too much time doing anything other than getting into this. What I want to speak to you about this morning is disappointment. And when I think of disappointment, I immediately think, because the word disappoint kind of bugs me, because the dis part shouldn't be there. And in my understanding, disappointment directly attacks the appointment on your life. It tries to dis it, to take it away, to get under it, to, to make you give up on it. You know, I, I remember a time in my life, and I uh, felt called to the ministry when I was, I think, t 12 years old, an altar call, and then, you know, the Lord send me, and you feel called into ministry, and it was only a couple years later, I, I don't know if you know this, I, I didn't grow up a pastor's kid all my life. I, I was an army kid, or an armed forces kid, grew up on the base in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, which is where I was born, so for the first seven years of my life, my paradigm was, I'm an armed forces kid. And then God spoke to my father, and all that shifted, and we moved to Edmonton, my dad went to Bible college, to chase after the dream and the calling on his life to be a pastor. Graduated Bible college, got a job at a church, now I'm, I'm a pastor's kid, and now I feel called to ministry, and everything's going really well, and all the young marrieds love my parents, and everything's going fantastic. And then the pastor of the church gets jealous because my dad's doing really well, starts spending, sp spreading rumors about my dad, saying bad things about my dad, and before you know it, my dad gets ax murdered by religion and is out of ministry, and there's a young man watching his parents go through what he's going through, facing extreme disappointment in something that has happened. And as a young boy, I don't know that I knew how to make the right choice, but we have to understand that disappointment sets itself up against the appointment on your life. So I want to start in the book of Joshua, and as I read this, I want you to listen to this how Joshua would have heard this, because Joshua has been through 40 years of disappointment in the desert. Unfulfilled promises, broken promises, loss of family and friends, you know, scorching heat and drought and everything, you name it. So, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. Now that would be hard to hear after 40 years of disappointment. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, to, and he just describes this massive area that he's giving to them as their inheritance. He says, oh, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. And then down to verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. When we read this scripture, this portion of scripture, there's something extremely powerful happening. What's happening here is the Father has just appointed Joshua in the midst of huge disappointment to a very great assignment of leading his people into the promises that he has spoken over them. And it's amazing what follows, because immediately as soon as there's an assignment and there's, the, there's an appointment, the thing that follows immediately is opposition, bumps in the road, the wilderness, challenges to face. So in chapter 2, Joshua sends out the spies to spy out the land, and then the king of Jericho sends men to, to take care of the spies, right, to wipe them out. 
at a prostitute's house, of all things. It's quite the epic start to the journey for Joshua. His spies end up hiding in a prostitute's house. Yeah. And then next, in chapter 3, the River Jordan. How many millions of people had to cross the River Jordan? Millions. It's quite the story. The point I'm making is when there's an assignment, there is opposition. When there is an appointment, there is an opportunity for disappointment. Now, I'm not sure how you read the story, but if we trace it backwards, we would realize that there is probably 40 years of disappointment with God that exists in their culture. And probably some disappointment with Moses as well. So think of the appointment on Joshua's life. Just, just think about what he's just been appointed to do. Joshua steps in after 40 years of wandering in the desert, promises being unfulfilled, a lot of doubters, a lot of naysayers, probably some complainers, and maybe even some whiners. But I'm pretty sure there was like a really healthy culture of disappointment. Now let me say this to you today carefully. And I've approached this subject soberly. I'm like, really, Lord? You want me to talk about this? A vital key to you stepping into the new season God has for you as a church, as life connection, is understanding and embracing your place of assign appointment and being honest about your disappointment. I read this uh, statement from Danny Silk. It's really good. It says, behavior becomes culture when it shows up in our children. If you think about the journey in Israel, 40 years, that's a bunch of generations. You know, and we can't be certain, but I'm pretty sure that the children of, that grew up in the desert, in this desert journey of 40 years, had some pretty strong influences towards being disappointed. So how did the children in the desert shift their culture from disappointment to expectation before entering into the promised land? Well, I'll be honest, I'm not sure that they did or could but they understood one thing, and I'd like you to remember this statement because it's important for you. The power of the appointment always supersedes the effect of the disappointment. Do you know what disappointment actually means? Defeated in expectation and hope. Disappointment sets itself up against your faith. This is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, is one of my favorite scriptures of all time. I have preached lots on it because it's lots of fun to talk about. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So follow with me as I try and reason through this with you so you can get the point. Disappointment sets itself up against our faith. And since faith requires action, Disappointment will affect the outflow of your faith, filled initiative in your life. In other words, disappointment will sterilize your effectiveness as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. So let me tell you this. Disappointment is actually toxic. If, it's, if, it, if left untracked, unchecked, it attacks the very fabric of your faith. And then if you live in that place of no expression of faith and disappointment, your heart becomes sick. The question, I guess, is hope deferred makes the heart sick. Who is our hope in? Sometimes disappointment comes because our hope was in the thing that it shouldn't have been in. If your hope is in anything other than Jesus, obviously we're, <laughs> we're going to be in a crash course for disaster, aren't we? Jesus is the hope for humanity. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Philippians 1, 6, who says, He who began a work in you will be faithful to complete it. So Jesus began a good work with you as individuals and as a faith community, and he will be faithful to complete it even when we face disappointment or challenges along the way. A scripture I shared with you earlier 
in uh, two, last two times ago, all things work together for go, to good for those who love him. It says all things, not all good things. It just says all things. So if we live surrendered lives, no matter what we go through, he works it together for good. So when disappointment has taken root in your life, it will cause you to stop dreaming and taking those risks that we take when we are faith-filled people. Disappointment or the fear of another disappointment will affect your decision making. Because as a young man, I actually, the, the effect of that incident with my father and mom was that I turned my back on God for years. I didn't want anything to do with it because I was afraid of being disappointed, afraid of being hurt again. So fear of another disappointment will affect your decision making and cause you to make decisions based on the predictable outcome rather than the hope-filled outcome. Does that make sense? In other words, when we fear disappointment, we sabotage a hopeful outcome by making decisions based on protecting our soul, soul rather than soaring in our spirits. Does that make sense? Example. If you've always dreamed of a certain profession, you always wanted to be this, but you've experienced setbacks or bumps along the way getting there, and you've been disappointed, you'll begin to make decisions based on a lesser fulfillment than the greater fulfillment of what you actually dreamed about. You'll decide not to risk, not to hope, and will self-protect in your decision-making, and will in turn create the disappointment that you feared. One area where we see this very prevalent is in this. Follow with me. After Jesus' life of incredible miracles, all the miracles Jesus did, we've read about them, we've heard about them, incredible life. After this life of all, these, all the teachings, in Mark chapter 16, he says this, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Acts chapter 1, verse 7. He said to him, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, these verses are for us too. Power, demons, serpents, poison, tongues, sick people, healing. It's directed at us as well. Yep. And here's the tension. What it says and what we experience. What you've believed for and what you've experienced. And disappointment wants to come and tell you that what you believe for, you can't believe for because you'll be disappointed again. And so we change our faith and we protect our hearts from being hurt by believing what's certain. Do you follow? I love uh, the story of John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Movement. So he gets radically saved and goes to a church and, and he's at the church and he's like, well, where's all this stuff that I read? You know, it's like, like what is this? Where's the sick people? And where's this? And they were like, well, no, that was that New Testament. And he's like, well, forget it, man. So he started the vineyard. And it was a vineyard movement in the beginning with all crazy stuff. So, because we maybe haven't seen the results we expected in some of these areas, we've changed our language and, our, and lived in expectation of lesser and in turn have chosen to live a Christian faith that doesn't believe for the impossible anymore. I'm showing you a road so that you can recapture your appointment. So whatever area God has appointed you to, Jesus must be the hope that your assignment is founded on. And his word must be the promise that holds you steady. When God appoints you, he will never disappoint you. The thing that 
I've come to realize is that when I encounter disappointment on my life, it is fully targeting the appointment on my life. It wants to dis or interfere or undo my God-given appointment. Now I want to give you the key to all of this that was hidden in plain sight in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 1. Three words. These are the three words from verse 1, chapter 1, that are the key to all of this. Standing in, this, standing in your appointment, overcoming disappointment, says this, the Lord said. The Lord said to Joshua. And Joshua heard, and then Joshua stood in his assignment because he heard. Hearing from a place of intimacy with the Father is the firewall we all need for disappointment. Our response in these difficult days of change and complicated cultural tensions because of many different events, both medical and historical, should not be to express our opinions and objections loudly, but rather to press in to the author and perfecter of our faith. And listen to what he says. Listen to his heart. Learn from him, draw close to him, hide ourselves in him. Hide yourself in him, the cleft of the rock, my hiding place. I love Calgary. I love the mountains. So I'm going to give you a picture of the mountains and what can happen up there. But we're going to go back to Moses first in Exodus 32, which leads up to what Graydon was speaking about with Joshua. And Joshua was also with Moses at this time. So in in Exodus 32, Moses was up the mountain with God, listening to him, had the commandments, comes down to the mountain to great disappointment. A golden calf, people following other gods, and his own brother that didn't stand up for what it was right. Could you imagine? Can't imagine that disappointment especially what God had told Moses in the first place. And then God saying to him, you go ahead to the land of milk and honey, but I'm not going with you because the people are stiff-necked and I would destroy them, so you go on ahead. Send my angel with you, but you go on ahead. Can you imagine the disappointment? Moses, Moses was steadfast still in his faith, although he was angry and disappointed and went through all those feelings which were very, very real. He said to God, no, please forgive these people. I know they're stiff-necked, but teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with me. And then he reminded the Lord that these are your people. And then God said to him in Exodus 33, 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses still in his, probably his disappointment stage said, okay, if your presence does not go with us, do us, do not send us up from here. Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face may not be seen. So what is a cleft? A cleft is going to be found in the rocks, and the rocks are usually found in the mountains. It's a narrow opening, a a crack, a gap, a cranny, a crevice. So 
Like I said before, I love the mountains. Love to go hiking. I don't know if you living this close to the mountains enjoy those hikes. They're not always easy. In fact, they're really never really easy. I was with a group of young adults a few years ago, and we were closer to where we live, so in the um, Abraham Lake area, and we did a, a hike called Tough Puff. And yeah, it is tough. Uh, and some of the people that went with us, they were maybe not so much hikers, others were. But uh, the leaders, myself and my son, we, we brought our own you know, equipment and extra coats, etc. Because you know that it, up top of the mountains, the weather can change suddenly. Even if the weather forecast is good, there can be sudden things that happen in the mountains. So we need to be prepared. So we went up the mountain with this group, and it was beautiful weather. In fact, some of them were wearing t-shirts, and I did not ask if they all had jackets. And as in the end, yeah, there was a couple that didn't have anything besides their t-shirts. And as we were up on the mountain, right on top, all of a sudden, a storm came. And not just a little storm, a storm. Lightning, thunder, hail. We were on the top. There was no covering. And it was like, oh, dear Lord. We, my son had a backpack with, of course, backpack has metal in it. And I had my hiking poles with metal. And it's like, and it came fast, just out of the blue, blindsided us. So prayed and ran. And it was a steep descent. I was like, where on earth are we going to go? The tree line is way, way down. And just kind of blindly in the hail and the rain, all of a sudden someone found a cleft in the rock. And somehow this covering, we were able to huddle in about 10 of us. I don't know how we did it. Because I went up there later and saw the same thing and thought, what? We all fit in that. And we did. We fit in there. And we were covered by the lightning and the, s and the hail and the rain. Although one of them put their GoPro out. <laughs> that wasn't so wise. But anyways, we were covered. And at that moment, I remembered an old hymn. And I don't know of how old you all are. But it was by Fanny Crosby. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. And he covers me there with his hand. And then there's another hymn, old hymn, in 1776 by a guy named Top Lady. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. <laughs> and I just really felt coming here today that God is just wanting you to come into his cleft and for him to cover you. And he is covering you, even if you don't feel like it. And there was another scripture that came to me in Isaiah 61. And I want to read this over you as a declaration. And it's prophesying the Messiah, Jesus, our rock, our hiding place. The spirit of the Lord, sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. This is a word for you, my friends, my dear ones. Beauty for ashes, fire takes life, but it also gives life and beauty. Ashes. You know that there's a lot of uses for ashes. It's used in gardens. It's very alkaline, and it's a great place for seeds to grow. 
It boosts potassium in plants and helps them flower. Now, I know you all live near the mountains and you've seen all the places where the fire has come and what comes, what's the first thing that comes in its place in the next, the next season? Fireweed. You know what I'm talking about? The beautiful fireweed. In the UK, it's called bombweed. And why is it called bombweed? Because the areas that were bombed, it was the first thing that appeared on those bomb sites in World War II. It's beautiful. Ashes is also a nat natural pesticide for those old seasoned gardeners, not old season, seasoned gardeners that would plant certain vegetables like cabbages. My mom would sprinkle ashes on them because it's a natural pesticide. It's also a polish for glass, stainless steel oven glass. It's a hand cleaner for those of people in, in remote areas that don't have soap. They can use ash as hand cleaner. And I just found this out for, um, from a member in our church who does pottery. Ash is used in glazes for bu building beautiful pottery. On the way here, Amanda Cook's song was playing, from the ashes you make beautiful things. And you always have the last word, and the last word is love. You may not be in the place right now to see beautiful things yet, and that is okay. It really is okay. It really is okay. So how do we get that oil of joy, the garment of praise, be oaks of righteousness, be the planting of the Lord, and rebuild the ancient ruins? Well, there's an invitation for you. And it's an invitation while you are grieving, while you're in your disappointment, wherever you are in life. And I'm going to read from Song of Solomon, chapter 2. The one I love calls to me, Arise, my dearest, hurry, my darling, come away with me. I have come as you have asked and draw you to my heart and lead you out, for now is the time, my beautiful one. The seasons have changed, but the bondage of your barren winter has ended, and the se season of hiding is over and gone. The rains have soaked the earth and left it bright with blossoming flowers. The season for singing and pruning the vines has arrived. I hear the queen of doves in our land, filling the air with songs to awaken you and guide you forth. Can you not discern this new day of destiny breaking forth around you? The early signs of my purposes and plans are bursting forth. The budding vines of new life are now blooming everywhere. The fragrance of their flowers whispers there is change in the air. I know that it's getting into winter, and you may say this isn't the right season, but this is a prophetic word. This is happening already. Just as tulips are planted in the fall, there's things that are already happening, okay? So life is, is happening. Flowers are about to bloom. Arise, my love, my beautiful companion, and run with me to the higher place. For now is the time to arise and come away with me. For you are my dove, hidden in the split open rock. It is I who took you and hid you up in the secret stairway of the sky. I just want to say those verses over again in the amplified version. And come away to climb the rocky steep steps of the hillside. Oh, my dove there in the clefts of the rock, in the sheltered and secret place of the steep pathway, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. For those of you who have gone up hikes in the mountains, it is not easy. It can be steep, it can be rocky, but there are clefts for you to hide. And God is saying, arise, come away with me. I want to draw you to my heart and lead you out. And then he says this, how beautiful you are, eyes of worship and lovely your voice in prayer. 
Let me see your radiant face and hear your sweet voice. You must catch the troubling foxes, those sly little foxes that hinder our relationship. For they raid our budding vineyard of love to ruin what I've planted within you. Will you catch them and remove them for me? We will do it together. In our disappointments, in our frustrations, in whatever we're going through, those little voices that Graydon even mentioned before that, ugh, oh, I'm just going to be disappointed again, or, ugh, oh, I just don't have the energy. I'm done. Don't let those little foxes ruin what God has appointed you to do. Don't let those little foxes, and he says, we will do this together. We'll catch them together, but come with me. Don't be afraid to climb up. I know it's been steep. I know it's been hard. I will cover you there with my hand. So this is an invitation to see his face to hide in him, Jesus. When Moses was in the cleft of the rock, he couldn't see God's face. But Jesus, with what he did on the cross, he's allowing us to see his face. There's another hymn that was, wrote, that was written but by Edward Moat in 1834. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ's solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So to conclude this morning, we want to encourage you. Yes, you have every reason to be disappointed. Every reason to have big questions. But we want to encourage you. Hide yourself in him. Find yourself in him. Settle in that place of intimacy in the cleft of the rock covered with him. Nothing else will do. Because the power of the appointment God has for you as a church supersedes the power of the disappointment you've went gone through. When we were praying over there this morning, I just felt like drop, Father dropped into my heart and he said this, that he wanted to release a Joshua anointing to give you strength to stand in the midst of great disappointment.